The Shadow of the Earth Tree trailer dropped less than a week ago, and the lore hunting community is in a bit of a tizzy. Wild speculations, utter confusion, and chaos have infected the once self assured lore hunters. And the worst part is, this is happening even with Miyazaki giving more information to us than ever before. It almost made things worse, because now there is nowhere to hide. He provides us just enough information to either bolster our theories or rip them down to their crucible-like state. Some proud hunters have even doubled down on their theories in spite of this new evidence, and are mustering enough might to finally jam that square peg into that round hole. Anyhow, I have yet to see a video that satisfies the story being told in both the base game and DLC trailer. I think this is due to a huge missing component of the story that has yet to be talked about in the mainstream. In my opinion, the following video is that missing link. Miyazaki hinted at there being a secret that the community has yet to unravel in the base game and I believe this may be it. So here is my attempt at providing the community the real story of the trailer and the hidden meaning of the title that Miyazaki hints at in his interview. Before we dive into this theory, I want to quickly cover something. I recently had a commenter, uh, Taylor Reed, mention that he really likes my ideas and make the most sense of the world for him, but because my theory seems to sideline or cheapen the rest of the characters and stories, it will be met with some resistance. And I totally agree with him, and thank you Taylor for bringing this to my attention. I am really not trying to do that or convey that they are just backup characters. I think they all hold incredible importance in this story and must be and will be brought up uh, when the time is right. We as content creators are up against a lot, and presenting a complex theory in a short, attention-grabbing way is probably the hardest thing. My goal with this theory is to expand on it once it reaches the main populace of lore hunters. I believe this to be the very foundation, the crucible, where the rest of the story comes in and makes much more sense. So yes, the Volcano Manor, Renala, the Eternal Cities, and much more have incredible important roles in the theory, which will be presented in future videos. But laying the foundation to build this house on is an unfortunate reality. So please do understand that I don't mean to discredit the rest of the story being told or anything like that. This is just what I believe to be the main thread or trunk which all these other branches come from. It's like if you were going to explain the Lion King to somebody in just a few sentences. You would probably say something like, there's a lion cub who was meant to be king because of his actions, his father dies, he feels responsible and leaves, uh, and then he comes back home and faces the truth, finally becoming his true self uh, king. Now there's obviously a lot more to the story, but that is the main thread. This is what I am presenting here today, just the main thread, at least in my opinion, that will help make sense of everything else coming down the pipe. Disclaimer. As always, what follows are simply my personal opinions and speculations. At the surface, some of these thoughts may seem difficult to grasp or far-fetched, but I believe them to be grounded in truth, and I believe if you are willing to give this video time, it will at the very least provide you with something to think about and hopefully a deeper understanding of Elden Ring. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope you enjoy. To start this video, we must first go back to the base game in order to get a full understanding of the DLC and to show that the elements portrayed in the trailer have been teased to us this whole time. Yes, even Mesmir. The theme of a dead or a lost child of America is a narrative that Miyazaki has subtly and artistically beaten over our heads from day one. The number of ways this theme is being presented are vast. The clues I'm about to give paint a picture of tragedy, specifically surrounding the loss of a child. And if taken singularly, they may not seem important, but when stacked on top of each other, the truth unravels. First, and probably most obvious, is the Death Spear that is impaling the womb of America. Next, we have the Iron Virgins who are cradling a newborn, weeping, and their wombs are full of snakes. Not exactly the preferred environment for fetal development. Also worth noting that they seem to be wearing very similar black gowns. Next, we have Renala, surrounded by empty cradles and completely consumed in the loss of her child. Next, we have the Harpies singing their woeful song of lament, which yet again tells a story of child loss and infertility. Then we have the map itself, a fetus in a womb, 
and in the fetus's belly is the lake of rot. And above the lake of rot is Renala, clutching the amber egg in hopes of birthing a child. Yet for some reason, each new birth is imperfect and dies soon after. Moving on, we have the story of Irina and Oscar, a once proud father who lost his child and has turned to chaos. And where does this take place, you may ask? In the Weeping Peninsula, where it is always raining and the music is somber. And how do we get to the Weeping Peninsula? By crossing the Bridge of Sacrifice. And wouldn't you know, that Bridge of Sacrifice is right next to the Impaler's Catacombs. Located in the Weeping Peninsula, where there is a castle literally named after an emotion, Mourn. To mourn means to feel or show deep sorrow or regret for someone or their death, typically by following conventions such as wearing of black clothes. And what is Merica wearing? A black gown. And at the end of this castle, we come to a site of grace named Mourn Moangrave. To moan is to make a long, low sound made by a person expressing physical or mental suffering. Then we have Queen Yarnum and the Yarnum Stone, a clear illustration of a miscarriage. And Queen Yarnum creates this nightmare where her consciousness still rise and creates this horrific dream world full of gods and Lovecraftian monsters. <clears throat> Oh, oh, uh, oh, sorry. That's a, that's a different game. Um, gosh, who makes that game? Um, uh, ah, it'll come to me. These clues are given to us throughout the game. Layered in narratives, enemy designs, and the map itself. All of this is conveying that Merica is either unable to give a successful birth, or had a miscarriage and she believes her womb is a place of death. Either way, she is suffering. She is suffering from the death of her unborn baby. All of this evidence tells us this story in different ways. It's up to us to put the pieces together. Now, at the surface, it may seem like this suffering would be caused by Godwin, the Golden, but that would be a false assumption that we will explain later in this video. This channel is focused on human psychology, more specifically Jungian depth psychology, and that is where we will find the hidden meaning behind the Elden Ring and the Shadow of the Earth Tree. In psychological terms, when someone goes through a traumatic event, such as a miscarriage or a life-saving abortion, they undergo what is called psychological dismemberment, or fracturing, where their once sturdy psyche is rocked to its core and shatters. Think of it like taking apart an engine to find the problem, fixing it, and putting it back together. I don't think it's a coincidence that the first area we come to is named Limgrave, and we are tasked with putting this psychological engine back together, much like the story of King Osiris. On a micro level, it alludes to the grafting of Godric, but on a grand scale, it is a clue that this is what we are tasked with doing. This suffering, fracturing, and reassembling is the story of Elden Ring. How do we see this psychological fracturing in game? Well, with the Elden Ring, of course. The demigods represent a psychological complex. Here is a quick explanation of a complex. Jung often used the term complex to describe a partially repressed, yet highly influential cluster of charged psychic material split off from, or at odds with, the conscious, stuck together agglomerations of thoughts, feelings, behavior patterns, and somatic forms of expression. Jung conceptualizes complexes as having a high degree of autonomy, describing them as splinter psyches, that form the basis for many personalities whom he called the little people. This provided the foundation for later expansion of the idea, most notably by British psychotherapist John Rowan, who referred to them as sub-personalities, each one operating as a semi-permanent and semi-autonomous region of the personality capable of acting as a person. These are the demigod children of America, splinter psyches that are bundles of emotions, feelings, and behaviors. These complexes are born during times of charged emotional or traumatic experiences. For example, a kid who was bullied in school for wearing glasses might develop a complex around this where his mini personality is born consisting of feelings of inferiority or perhaps rage. 
These complexes can be good or bad, positive or negative, depending on the conditions they were born from. If they are born from a positive experience, they will have a more helpful personality. On the other hand, if they are born from a negative experience, they will be akin to self-sabotage or emotional states of destruction. Complexes are held together by the ego, acting as an anchor, and when in balance, orchestrate the totality of America's personality. What's interesting about these complex archetypes is they usually come in pairs or as twins, where eventually a positive one will be born to counterbalance a negative one. This allows balance in the psyche, balance being a major theme in Elden Ring. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of these complexes is they are known as splinter psyches and can operate as a fully autonomous person. Before I move on, I think it would be helpful to tie these psychological terms to their Elden Ring counterparts. The game does an amazing job of giving these concepts either a character or symbol that directly corresponds to their psychic roles. Here is a quick and simplified list. America's psyche as a whole is the Elden Ring. The persona is America herself acting in this godlike mania. The ego is Godwin the Golden who gets dismantled in the Night of the Black Knives and who once held everything together as the anchor room, now held by a distant relative. Ego consciousness is the Erdtree, basically a symbol of everything America deems acceptable about herself and society a beacon of how one should live their life. The demigods are complexes, splinter psyches that prior to Godwin, the ego's death, were once in bounce, making up the Elden Ring, but now act on their own volition. These complexes are born from times of highly emotional occurrences. The personal shadow is the Glomide Queen, the direct opposite to America, the Persona. Now, just as America has a lord which enforces her laws on society, aka the Animus, so it seems does the Glomide Queen. That enforcer is Mesmir. He represents the cultural or collective shadow, a culmination of all things heretical and blasphemous to society and the earth tree. The entirety of the shadow is represented in the Shadowlands and by the Shadow Tree. We will cover Mikola later on in this video as his role is obviously incredibly important. All I will say for now is that our prediction in the Elden Lord video seems to have come to fruition. With these connections, the rest of the game, DLC, and hopefully this video will make things more digestible and perhaps shed some light on hidden meaning of the story of Elden Ring. When Merica's psyche, aka the Elden Ring, shatters, these complexes are no longer bound together and in balance, but rather are scattered. And remember, this all starts with the death of Godwin the Ego. It is in this state that the splinter psyches war over control and dominance and gain full autonomy. Don't you find it strange that these children are very singularly focused? They are more closely aligned to an emotion than to a fully developed child of a god, at least in my opinion. The very fast version of the story is that America is walking around the world, the real world that is, not the lands between, all happy-go-lucky when tragedy strikes her in the form of a miscarriage or life-saving abortion. This trauma causes a psychological fracturing, and we are there to pick up the pieces just like the body parts of King Osiris. This entire story is taking place inside America's psyche, just like Bloodborne took place inside Queen Yarnum's. These two queens' consciousness, having suffered perhaps the worst thing imaginable to a parent, is writhing and building a nightmare world which they are stuck in until they face this trauma and heal it once and for all, allowing them to rebuild their psyche in a more whole, unified version of its previous self. The key to stability with this darker nature is not to give in to the shadow, but to embrace it, and how it helps define one as a person, and find a balanced way to express it in one's daily life. Interacting with and overcoming the shadow in this way is often best done by self-reflection, meditation, dreaming, dreaming, did I say dreaming, or daydreaming. With the goal of self-discovery and the process is commonly referred to as shadow work. 
Another big part of this story is Merica and her psychological shadow, almost certainly the hidden meaning of the title Miyazaki is referring to. Directly below the ripples of the watery unconscious lives the shadow. In analytical psychology, there is an unconscious aspect of the personality that does not correspond with the ego ideal, leading the ego to resist and project the shadow, leading to a conflict with it. In short, the shadow is the self's emotional blind spot, the part the ego does not want to acknowledge. The term shadow in the game provides a crucial clue from which we can extract significant information. Notably, there are entities referred to as shadowbound beasts. In the game, encapsulating within themselves the antithesis of their Empyrean counterparts. To envision this, think of the shadowbound beast as metaphorical bank vaults. The larger the treasure they conceal, the more substantial the vault must be. As explored in my Glomide Queen video, the enormity of Malekith compared to other shadowbound beasts stems from him harboring a colossal item, the very concept of death. Malekith, in essence, safeguards the very element that Merica expelled from her order. Now, we see an entire land veiled from existence, and held within it dwells the outcast and defeated elements, the repressed, forgotten, and shunned. Indeed, in psychology, the term shadow carries profound and dark significance. It serves as the ominous counterpart to the ego persona, embodying the aspect of ourselves the ego resuppresses. The shadow is a repository of what we tend to ignore, feel ashamed of, and lock away from the world's view. It represents the concealed dimensions of our psyche, holding both the hidden potential for creativity and the darker, more challenging aspects of our nature. Exploring and integrating the shadow is a crucial aspect of the individuation process, as it involves confronting and reconciling with these suppressed elements to achieve a more complete and authentic sense of self. If Merica's consciousness is shown by the Golden Order, then her shadow would be everything that was plucked from this order and shoved into the deep recesses of her psyche, also known as the Shadowlands. The persona is contrasted against the shadow, meaning that the persona and the shadow are opposites of one another. Merica and the Glomide Queen, Ertree and the Shadow Tree, Life and Death, faith and blasphemy, acceptance and rejection. Jung wrote that if awareness of the projection of the shadow remains repressed, it will have consequences on the ego. What he means by this is that if the shadow remains hidden, it will take matter into its own hands and dismantle the ego. Basically, when ego consciousness emerges out of the unconscious, it fractures our psyche like a plane of glass. This initial fracture is the persona in the shadow. The thing we want the world to see, and the beast we hide from the world. This creation and repression of the shadow occurs very early on in life, sometime in childhood. As soon as a child learns what the parent or society wants from them, and how they gain acceptance, everything that opposes that gets locked away in the shadow. The growth and development of the shadow is directly correlated to the growth and development of the ego consciousness. As stated earlier, the symbol of this ego consciousness is represented in the Ur tree. So, as the Ur tree grows, so too does the shadow tree. As above, so below. The Ur tree in its infancy was just a wee sapling, and the shadow it cast was just as small. However, the more America developed this ego persona, the bigger the earth tree grows and the brighter it becomes. Thus, the bigger and darker the shadow grows. When a shadow becomes too big to be sealed away, that seal will begin to leak and the effects of the shadow will seep into the conscious world of America. We see this come to life in Elden Ring a few different ways. Some shadow overflow comes via the demigods themselves, where they represent the shadow rather than the ego. Another overt spill of the shadow is the stolen rune of death from Malekith. Malekith simply cannot hold back the enormity and rage of the shadow any longer, and a small piece finds its way to the lands between. This tiny scrap of the shadow is so powerful that it can literally dismantle the ego and pollute the world with death root, slowly but surely taking over America's precious world. 
The psychological rule says that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. That is to say, when the individual remains undivided and does not become conscious of his inner opposite, the world must preforce act out this conflict and be torn into opposing halves. This leads us to the role of the shadow. The shadow is the counterbalance to the persona. When the persona becomes too grandeur and godlike, the shadow will knock it down, back to reality, and serves as a humble reminder that they are not perfect. This is why the Black Flames, a literally a shadow that is hurled, is able to kill gods. However, when someone such as Merica locks away and suppresses their shadow, the scales tip in the favor of the persona with nothing to correct it. When this occurs, the subject, in our case Merica, believes itself a god, a divine being that can do nothing wrong and is the pinnacle of existence. This state of existence leads to neuroses such as megalomania, ego inflation, and narcissism. Merica lives much of her life from the state of megalomania. She believes her and her faith are the only proper way to live. She demands much of her subjects and expects greatness from all around her, or sacrifices they will be. This is why killing the god Merica is so important. Until this happens, the world cannot self-correct, and the shadow cannot do its job. This adds a deep understanding to why we need to release her shadow, Destined Death, which is the act that finally allows us to kill the god. It is what the shadow does. So, that is the story of Elden Ring in a very, very tiny nutshell, told in an expedient way, but it's an important aspect that I never hear anyone talk about. Applying this psychological lens to the base game will make the lore so much more complete and provide a new depth and understanding that has yet to reach the mainstream lore hunters. With this quick explanation, I believe you could connect the dots in a powerful and meaningful way without me. However, that's my job, so knock it off and let me be your helpful guide through this incredibly exciting 3-minute trailer and 2 interviews Miyazaki has blessed us with. I am not going to dissect the trailer or go over the interviews as I believe by now they have reached every corner of the Elden Ring world. If you have been watching my channel for some time now, almost everything we predicted in our DLC prediction video is shown in this trailer. We predicted that Merica would be traveling to this shadowy upside down world where she will finally confront her other half, showing love and acceptance to her once repressed and locked away self. This will allow her to finally heal from this trauma and fully reassemble her psyche to form her inner god, also known as the self. We predicted this world would be a different dimension occurring at the same time as the lands between, and that the things inside this world would be chaotic disorganized and a culmination of everything antithesis to America and her order. We predicted this would be caused by the death of her child and that the inner world would reflect this inner trauma. We predicted in the Elden Lord video that Mikola would be the guide and facilitator in this quest. We also predicted that the Glomide Queen would be the final task for the PC and although that is not shown in the trailer, I still believe this will occur. My guess is that the Glomide Queen is in the Shadow Tree, just as Merica was in the Erd Tree, and we won't get to her until we defeat Mesmir. We predicted Merica would need to reassimilate her shadow as her final step of individuation. The other three steps seem to have occurred in the base game. The assimilation of the Ego Persona, the Animus, Radagon, and the Self, Melina. The final thing to do is to travel to the Shadowlands to do the same thing here. Another thing we have explored is a possible reason for confining death in the first place, which may be tied to the death of her father when Merica was young. And although we may never find this out, I do find it interesting that we see a portrait of a man and a pregnant woman, and later this man is literally about to rip his head off. I am eager to find the implications on that. Let's start with the beginning of the trailer. We have an unknown character standing in front of Mikola in his cocoon. Now, whether this character is someone we know or not holds little value, at least for now. They could literally be the most important NPC of all time, or just a visual of where we enter the DLC, so speculating on it seems trivial until we have more information. What is really important is what the narrator is saying. 
what this sentence is telling us is nothing new to the character of Mikola. He is a healer, pure of heart, and uses love to guide his path. He has the ability to dissolve men of their sins and wrongdoings as evidenced by his needle in the sanctuary he attempts to create for all. The process of healing one's trauma, finding their true selves, and completing the process of individuation is a terrifying journey. What it entails is reliving and facing these once repressed traumas. I believe this is why the narrator says the following. The fact that we enter the DLC through his cocoon comes as no surprise. But what does seem to confuse us is the fact that we must defeat Moog, no duh, and Radon. At first this may seem random and confusing, but it actually makes perfect sense. Jung states that this descent into our own darkness to heal and self-realization is met with considerable resistance. As stated earlier, demigod children represent complexes or strong emotional states of being. One of our most powerful emotions is this resistance to change. It halts progression, keeps the current status quo, and is akin to the saying, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. No matter how terrible things may be, our fear of and resistance to change is one of the primary forces that drives not only our individual lives, but society by extension. We will dive deeper into the concept later in this video, but when the demigods aka complexes are born, they are born as opposites of each other and their respective divine towers show this opposition. Radon and Rikard are an example of these two opposites, two sides of the same coin, which is why their great runes are the same but different. Basically the tagline of the DLC, the same but different, two sides of the same coin, or as above so below. Rikard is all about blasphemy, and taking down the gods and the Ur tree. Verdon is the counterforce to this. He is about keeping things the way they are, resisting change, and wants to remain in this naive, bliss-like state, evidenced by his little horsey friend, Linen. In the base game, defeating Verdon literally allows us to explore the depths of the map, aka America's inner world, where we find parts of the past and the hidden treasure of Nokron a sword capable of freeing oneself from the grasp of the current world order. And wouldn't you know, that sword is made from a corpse, perhaps alluding to this death of America's child. Defeating Radon sets everything in motion and we can no longer hide from the truth. It allows for the eclipse to take place. The eclipse is a symbolic form of ego death where the light of the sun is blocked out by the shadow. In alchemical text, this is known as Soul Niger and is incredibly important. Speaking of Rani and the Finger Slayer Blade, let's quickly talk about her and her ending. If the demigods are complexes of intense emotion, what would Rani resemble? Well, she's cold, dark, tired, and wants to take a very lonely path of solitude where she leaves this world for good and has it plummet into a cold, dark abyss. To me, this screams of melancholy or depression, where an unfortunate and all too common result is suicide. If Ronnie represents depression, a very intense negative emotion, it would make sense that it would be her that set in motion these events of psychological fracturing. If in fact Ronnie did commit this terrible ending of her life, that could be another reason for the corpse-like finger slayer blade, a symbol of the sacrifice needed to rid oneself of this world. All the demigods have this in common, a counterpart where their great rune sits atop the opposite divine tower. And take note where all these converge, right at this cloud which seems to be concealing something which is also happens to be right under the Ur tree, almost where a shadow would be cast. More on the significance of this later. Miyazaki explains that Mikola is a very important figure in this DLC and that he followed Merica down there, and we are following in his footsteps. This is yet another prediction we made in our Elden Lord video, explaining that Mikola will act as the final stage of Merica's animus. Her male counterpart, her logos, her order. Let's recap what the final stage of the animus does, and how Jung explains this concept. 
In the fourth stage, the animus is the incarnation of spiritual meaning. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, or Dalai Lama. On this highest level, like the anima as Sophia, the animus mediates between a woman's conscious mind and the unconscious. In mythology, he appears as Hermes, messenger of the gods. In dreams, he is a helpful guide. There's that word again, dream. We know that Mikola divests himself of his body, lineage, and all things golden, and seems to be facilitating Merica and whatever she is doing down there. He is almost a spirit guide, someone capable of traveling between worlds and guiding us to wholeness. He is a mediator between these worlds. A very important part of the definition of the fourth stage of the Animus is this last sentence. In mythology, he appears as Hermes, messenger of the gods, and dreams he is a helpful guide. Probably the most overt illustration in the trailer is the fact that we see America's bedchamber veil shrouding the Shadowlands. Now recall that part of the shadow work is done while one sleeps. Dreams act as a bridge between these two worlds. Perhaps this is one of the reasons we see these bedchamber veils. As brought up in my livestream about the DLC, one of my viewers mentioned that the concealing veils used by the shadowy assassins, strangely with direct ties to America, seems to be cut from this same cloth. This is such a beautiful theory and makes total sense. This veil is concealing both this hidden shadow world and the assassins that make their way to the surface and dismantle America's ego. The Greek god Hermes is associated with the Caduceus the symbol of Hermes. This is remarkably similar to the Halig tree sigil. Hermes is born of Zeus and is known for being able to traverse between the world of gods and men, of life and death, of heaven and hell. Quote, he was the messenger of the gods and the mediator between the realm of the dead and the kingdom of the living. The Greeks called him Hermes, the Romans called him Mercury. The alchemical tradition talks about mercury and used Latin to hide many of the secrets of alchemy. But really, the word mercury comes from the Greek Hermes, so we need to study the Greek. In the Greek tradition, Hermes is the messenger of the gods, and one who conveys all the knowledge and wisdom of the gods to the other gods, and to humankind, and even into hell. End quote. So Hermes is also Mercury, or Mercurius, in alchemy, which is incredibly important, especially knowing how prevalent alchemy is in Elden Ring. Quote, In alchemical traditions, Hermes, or Mercurius, is seen as an emblem of transformation, embodying both the material and spiritual changes that alchemists sought. Jung interpreted these alchemical transformations as metaphors for psychological changes with Hermes standing as the symbol of transformation. Mercurius is known as the cosmic womb, where everything came from and where all opposites once lived in harmony and will ultimately come back to, to reunite. Mercury is also the substance that is neither solid nor liquid and is able to shift between the two. It is also the substance used to amalgamate gold and silver, or in our case, persona and shadow. Here we have a vase, and the description of the vase is as follows. All of us here who are suffering in the lower worlds need help from Hermes Mercury if we are able to get out. Of course, in this tradition, we always study these symbols for what they are. Symbols. Myths that hide a truth. The symbol of Mercury hides something in ourselves. The dead warrior on this face does not represent a literal dead warrior. It represents a warrior of consciousness. It represents someone who is dying mystically, psychologically, someone who is sacrificing himself and destroying and removing all that is impure and animal in order to be reborn as something new. Mercury, Hermes, is the one who facilitates that process of thorough change. So who is Mikola exactly, and what is he doing in the Shadowlands? Well, he's a healer who wields love. He is a spiritual guide a Hermes-like character who can go between worlds and act as a mediator of them. He represents the womb where everything came from and where ultimately everything goes back into. He is the substance that unites the opposites and forges something new and better. He is there facilitating America and her journey to finally confront her shadow and bring it back into her life. 
embracing this aspect of herself and forging her inner god. This is the story of the DLC and the reason both him and Merica are in this world. They need each other for this process to be completed. While watching the trailer coupled with Miyazaki's interviews, the location of this place becomes obvious. It's the Crucible, the origin of everything, where life was once all blended together. The good, the bad, the accepted and repressed, the up and down, the us and them. No divisions, no judgment, no fractures. Now, knowing that Mercurius represents the womb and is the place where everything comes from, we can draw a direct connection between the concept of the Crucible and the womb. This becomes eye-opening when we scale out from the map and notice that the map is a fetus in a womb. And where does this cloud that is more than likely hiding the Shadowlands sit? Right in the middle. Right where the umbilical cord would be. The life-giving connection between baby and mother. Miyazaki has been smacking us upside the head this whole time, and to be honest, I am shocked it is not talked about. Not to mention the pregnant woman in the DLC trailer clutching her belly, showing us exactly where we are and the importance of the womb. To further this claim, I want to show you an alchemical illustration of what is called the descent into the bath. It is part of the Rosarium Philosophorium, a recipe of the philosopher's stone that is told through illustrations, a common practice to keep their work hidden from the repressive powers that be. This illustration shows two figures, a man and a woman, representing opposites. A common misconception is that the Rebus is born just from the Red King and White Queen, but the truth is, is that they are just meant to represent pairs of opposites. Sitting in this bath could equally be gold and silver, the sun and the moon, left and right, up and down, or ego and shadow. These figures are sitting in a hexagonal bath of Mercury, or the Mercurial bath, which is supposed to represent a descent back into the womb where these opposites were born. The white dove above them is their spiritual guide facilitating them in this pursuit. Edward Ettinger summarizes Jung's analysis of the situation and says, quote, Salutio is an image of the descent into the unconscious that has the effect of dissolving the solid, ordered structure of the ego. For the alchemist, the solution meant the return of differentiated matter, or separated matter, to its original undifferentiated state, to the prima materia. Water was thought of as the womb, and to enter the water, the solution was to return to the womb for rebirth. End quote. In the secret book of artifice, it says this, quote, Dissolve then soul and luna in our dissolving water, which is familiar and friendly, and the next in nature unto them. And as it were, a womb, a mother, an original, the beginning and end of their life. And because soul and luna have their origin from this water, their mother, it is necessary, therefore, that they enter into it again, to wit, into their mother's womb, that they may be regenerate or reborn again, and made more healthy, more noble, and more strong. Remember, Sol and Luna are just meant to be placeholders for any pair of opposites, so this holds true regardless of the pair. These pairs of opposites originate from this mercurial fountain, the mother's womb, where they were once part of an unconscious matrix. From there, they split off, but will once again reunite in this water. Knowing that America and everything has their origins from this womb, this mercurial fountain, this watery matrix, really makes sense of the obelisk in Nakron, which shows people arriving by boat. It's because everything came from this life-giving liquid. And wouldn't you know, we see ships in the DLC trailer. Let's go back to the Divine Towers. They represent opposites. Always dying and unborn. Melania and the Unborn Rune, Loyalty and Blasphemy, Radon and Rikard, and Acceptance and Rejection, Godwin originally, and the Omen Twins cast to the sewers. These towers form a hexagon, and in the middle is water, and more importantly, the Mother's Womb. Where these converge is where they came from, and where they must return to reunite. And they need Mikola, the spiritual guide, to facilitate this. The hidden meaning of the Divine Towers finally revealed. 
profound, deep, and awe-inspiring world building by FromSoft, which might go down as the most incredible bit of lore in Miyazaki's already incredible tenure. In his interviews, Miyazaki tells us that the Shadowland is where America first steps foot and where she became a god and the birth of the Earth Tree. All this lines up and makes total sense now. This is her mother's womb, where she was literally born. On this channel, we have discussed the possibility of Fair Missoula being America's childhood, and I think this could be the confirmation we need. To unpack this, let's quickly recall some things about the Shadowland location. It represents the mother's womb, the mercurial fountain, the crucible, an unconscious matrix where everything was once blended together. It is where America first stepped foot, aka where she was born and where she became a god and started the earth tree of her order of, well, order. To prove this, let's yet again go back to Jung and depth psychology. Jung explains that there are four stages of the human psychological development broken down by age. I won't cover them all, as today we only need one to discuss the Shadowlands. This first stage is birth to childhood, and is as stated, an archaic or chaotic state. In this first stage, the child is still in the unconscious state. The psychology of the baby and the psychology of the parents, particularly the mothers, are undifferentiated. The parents act as the ego for the baby, for the baby has yet to develop his own ego. This is saying that Merica and her mother are still consciously linked, and Merica is still in the quote-unquote metaphorical womb. Since the interaction of the baby is limited, their awareness can be described as sporadic. It is unable to form chronological memories. This explains why, in general, people find it difficult to remember the events that happened to them when they were infants. Young referred to this as an island of memories. Basically, what is occurring in this stage is the crucible, the unconscious matrix where everything is blended together. The infant has yet to develop an ego persona and is thus unfractured and whole. There is no repression or hiding of anything. Then, when the infant matures into childhood, this happens. As the child learns to separate himself from the rest of the world, his ego forms. There arises a sense of I. Consequently, this is the time when the child starts to speak of itself in the first person. I am hungry and is able to refer to himself as the object as well. Give me. During this time, memories start to develop chronologically. In other words, the island of consciousness or memories becomes continents. According to Jung, very young children are still connected with the collective unconscious, which comprises the archetypes, mythologies, or big dreams of mankind. Sometime around the age of five, a child develops an ego and persona and thus begins the war between consciousness and unconscious, the desired and repressed, the persona and shadow. I believe the statue we see in Malachi's boss room is a memory, a snapshot of this exact moment where her ego emerges from the unconscious matrix and a quote unquote God is born. The statue is the representation of these opposites order and chaos, knowledge and instinct, persona and shadow, which we know to be symbolized in game by wolves in the number three. I believe this is the war that occurred in the Shadowlands, a war of opposites where one side prevailed and the other remained sealed away. The way I understand the narrator during this part of the trailer is that there was no right or wrong, but different sides to a war and the residents of the Shadowlands just happen to be on the losing side of this war. Fair Missoula, once a part of this crucible, is blown off and becomes the first instance of America's godhood. This is why Plassey has two heads and is allowed to dwell in the consciousness. He represents, now, order. This is also why Malekith is here. If Merica started her godhood by plucking out the rune of death, it makes perfect sense that he would be here stuck in this memory. Here is what is said about the first half of life. The task of the human being is outer development or the initiation into outward reality. This means that for Jung, when a child is born, he has to undergo the process of detaching himself from the Garden of Eden, or the unconscious, instinct, just existence, sloth state. 
The job here is to develop a persona that would allow humans to function productively in the society. Persona, according to Jung, means mask, or the image we project based on the acquired personality. It is the face that we show the world. Let's apply this to Elden Ring. So the crucible is where all life came from and is representative of the self, where all things are blended together, aka our inner god. Now from this place a fracture occurs, I believe this to be the war mentioned in the trailer. And the desired ego consciousness, aka the persona, rises out of this and all that is left behind is the things unwanted and repressed by that same persona. All that is left dwelling in the crucible are the losers of this war, the shadow, the unwanted. This is why there are two trees here, the Erd and Shadow Tree. During this fracture, the Erd Tree, well a projection of it, reaches the surface and only the Shadow Tree is left. Merica, bringing back her ego consciousness and finally facing her shadow is what we see Mikola doing at the end. The Erd Tree has returned home, and the two trees together will rule as a stronger version of themselves. My guess is that the Shadow Tree will stay black and wrapped around the Erd Tree, which will return to its golden hue. Only this time it will be real. After all of this, we have yet to talk about Mesmir, the enigmatic figure that has lore hunters going crazy. Well, let's look back at the very beginning of this video where we demonstrate all the examples of clues that Merica lost a child. We know that Mesmir never reaches the surface, or at the very least, no one knows he exists. Why is this? Well, if the Shadowlands is where people go when they die, my guess is Mesmir was never actually born, and thus the lost child of Merica. There are several clues that allude to this, so let's cover them. First is the fact that the Shadowlands is all about death, and he sits on the same chairs of the demigods, and is obviously a child of Merica. If no one knows him, and he rules this area, it is more than likely that this is the only place he knows. Next, let's look at his design. His long lengthy limbs seems to be a model reserved for dead heroes or royalty. Mikola and the Cocoon, the hero grave statues, all share this, and they are also all dead. Next, let's look at the Weeping Peninsula, where it's always raining and the music is somber, where we cross the Bridge of Sacrifice, where an NPC is reeling over the death of his child, and right next to that is the Impaler's Catacombs. And not to mention everything associated with Castle Morn. Oh, and Merica is holding a baby behind him, eerily similar to the Weeping Iron Virgins. Before we get into my personal speculations on Mesmir, let's discuss some of the more prevailing theories surrounding him. The first is he is the unwanted child that the ghost is talking about next to the walking mausoleum. Although that is possible, let's remind ourselves of some things. One, Merica states that if her children don't make something of themselves, she will sacrifice them. And on a psychological note, this is just as simple as a complex that no longer serves you and you more or less just forget about it. We know that on the night of Black Knives, many demigods were killed and Merica seems to be behind it. So my guess is this is the answer to what that noble is saying. If there is any unwanted child of Merica, it would be the Omen Twins who she literally shackles to the bottom of the sewers. If she was going to exile anyone, it would most probably be Moog and Morga. The other thing is Merica is clearly in mourning. She is suffering and you don't mourn over something you don't want. If someone rips a piece of chocolate cake from your hands, you might be a little pissed. But if someone takes broccoli instead, well, that's a big fat zero on the emotional Richter scale. And yes, I just compared Moog and Morgat to a piece of broccoli. Another popular one is that he is the son of Radigan and Merica because he has red hair. But let's remind ourselves that red is the color of the crucible and it saturates the trailer. The boar wears red, we have a red dancer, the red haired rune bear, and tons more, even our character wears red. This would also mean that he was born after the conquest of Godfrey. So unless we are going to turn this into a rom-com and Merica is sneaking out with her boyfriend during this time, it doesn't seem to fit. So if Mesmir was a weapon used by Merica during her wars, he would have to be the son of Godfrey, not Radigan. Now, it's possible he was born this blasphemous child, and she didn't want the world to know, but again, 
Why not do that to the Omen Twins? Why not do that to the Snake Warriors? Hell, why not do that to Rykard? She's worried about blasphemy and snakes. Just go down to the next town over and banish them. Then we have the butterfly theory. But now there are at least four of them total based off of this character in the trailer. So I'm not sure why we would take out Melina and insert Mesmir. The only thing I can think of is that the Quaternity is a very important symbol in Elden Ring. The cross is a symbol of it. The Golden Road and its symbol. Most of the sigils are symbols of it. Four represents wholeness and unity, so discovering a fourth butterfly makes total sense. But I'm not sure about inserting Mesmir into that theory. Not really agreeing or disagreeing with it, it just seems unnecessary. Especially since most of us thought that Melina fit the description perfectly. Now, if Melina did not fit the description and during the game we were scratching our heads, then sure. But I just don't see it. Again, this theory could very well be correct, these are just my two cents. Mesmir being a safeguard and bulwark of the shadow is really cool, but that's kind of Malachis' whole job. So I think if Mariko is going to send anyone there, it would have been him. Also, if it's hidden and veiled from the world, then who cares? I mean, Marika still fought the dragons and giants and won. She doesn't seem to need a bulwark. Anyways, back to Mesmir. Let's talk about his appearance and his abilities. First, in my opinion, he wields the Flame of Death. The way it comes from his hand, the color, and the entire reason for his flame seems to be to kill things. Again, strange to me that people just jump past this, even though the narrator says that people die in his flame. So he has an element of destined death to him. He has serpents and dragons everywhere, another heretical aspect of the Ur tree. And in an interview, Miyazaki explains that the Crucible was the same time as the dragons ruled. Lastly, he has the red hair, and in my opinion, not because of Radagon, but because of the Crucible. Remember, the base game tells us that red is the color of the Crucible, so seeing red everywhere in the DLC trailer is yet another clue showing us where we are heading to. Another fun fact is that the Animus, aka Radagon, also comes from this place, and I believe that that is why he has red hair to begin with. If you want an 8 hour detailed explanation, you will have to go watch my two part DLC streams where I cover these concepts in great detail. Just imagine if all you knew were these heretical things, and you were supposed to be a child of a god. You would more than likely soak up these and become the culmination of your surroundings, just like children do. Because he was quote unquote born here, Mesmir, all he knows is this stuff and becomes the ultimate weapon of the shadow. His line is probably the most badass line in all of Elden Ring. The way he says mother gives me chills every time I hear it. It's clear to me that he is mocking her, asking how her kingdom has fallen to such lowly tarnished like us. Recall that the shadow is the unwanted and outcast of the psyche, and of the game. So anytime they see the ego consciousness fall, it's a victory for them. And I think it's safe to say that that ego consciousness is nosediving. Now, these are just my own personal speculations, and it's very possible that any of these theories are true. And although they seem to fit the 3 minute DLC, I don't think they seem to fit the 100 hour base game and its themes. Why not do the same thing with Moog and Morgoth? I mean, if they are going to be cast away, why not cast them away into the Shadowlands? They are literally shackled to the earth and cast into the sewers. If the Shadowlands are a place that America could just send anything unwanted, then why not do it there? She most certainly would have done that with these Omen Twins. And if it's about Mesmer's strength and then shunning him, why not use Radon or Melina or even Moog? I mean, all of those demigods are incredibly powerful. Although I do like that theory and think it's pretty cool, I just don't see that being the case. To me, it seems much more likely that Mesmer was born here, rules over this domain and kills anything that walks through those doors. You might be asking yourself, hey, Sinnard, if Mesmir was born here, how does he even know about the lands between and the Golden Order? Well, to answer this, we need to turn to Deathroot. I'm sure by now you have noticed that Deathroot has eyes and more specifically fish eyes. Well, the fish that is Godwin anyways. Funny enough, there is a psychological explanation for this, which is known as Oculi Piscium, or multiple fish eyes. You see, in a healthy psyche, these eyes represent luminosities which shine lights in the darkness from our conscious 
into the unconscious and basically lets us keep an eye on things that are happening down there. However, in a fractured psyche or one taken over by the shadow, these eyes grow up from the shadow and now they are looking at you, the ego consciousness. The eyes on the death route are much more than just a creepy design element. They are literally a way for the Shadowlands to see what is occurring above the surface. This is how Mesbir knows what's happening. My guess is he won't even be surprised when Merica, Mikola, and us encounter him, as he would have literally seen it coming. If Mesmir is this dead unborn child of Merica, whose consciousness resides in the Shadowlands, then it is him Merica is going back here for. He represents the trauma, the event that shatters her world. He represents the hurt and pain she is in, why she weeps and mourns and moans at his grave, why he is the dark cloud over her head and until she can move past this trauma and heal it, she will remain fractured and in this shadowy realm. This is why America is here, and that is why Mikola followed her, to facilitate this healing and purifying process. My guess is that America's consciousness went to the Shadowlands right as she fractured. If these are all aspects of America's psyche and Godwin, the ego, was sacrificed and thrown to the roots, slowly taking over by the watery unconscious, it provides yet another answer to his appearance. This is why things are going to hell in a handbasket above the surface and why she is inanimate. This is why the two fingers have no purpose, why the connection to the greater will is gone, and why the endings won't change. She is not there and will never return. We are healing and unifying the better new version of where it all started, which is the purpose of the individuation process. After all, as Jung says, proper development is the rediscovery of the child we left behind. Well, there you have it. My overall theory of the base game, quickly told and explained. And as a note, yes, this does not explain every single detail of the game, but I do think it is the central theme and will be the central theme of the DLC. To recap, Merica is a real person and we are entering into her psyche. Merica loses this child and her inner world becomes this chaotic place full of trauma. Prior to that, things were going relatively well. And again, just as you and I, assuming you have not recently gone through a terrible tragedy, life is pretty good. This time represents the Age of Plenty, where the flow of Ertree Sap, what I see as America's life energy or libido, flows like wine, where beautiful women instinctively flock like the salmon of Capistrano. <laughs> Sorry, I could not help myself. After this traumatic event, her inner world begins to crumble. Her life energy fades and the shadow slowly takes hold. She enters what is called the Dark Night of the Soul, where she undergoes ego death and begins the process of healing and individuation. Her final step is the painstaking journey is to finally confront this trauma once and for all, healing this part of herself and embracing what she once repressed. It is a story that has been told to us through different clues and games. I was recently watching a live stream from Quelog, shout out Quelog, I adore your stuff, where she stated that Mesmir was a complete surprise and that no lore hunters have even mentioned a child before. And I have to respectfully disagree. This is something we on my channel have been talking about for months now. By looking at all the clues in game and deciphering the hidden story being told, we did successfully predict this and I can't wait to see what unfolds on June 21st. I hope you will join me as we further uncover the secrets of Elden Ring, and lastly, I really encourage you to play the game another time. I mean, we're all going to do it anyways to prep a DLC character. I would encourage you to take note of all these clues while you're playing and see what they mean to you. I think it will add a new layer of understanding previously hidden from the eye. After all, the best place to hide something is right under our nose. To wrap this video up, I want to look at the final few seconds of the DLC trailer. But before we do that, let's look one last time at the DLC teaser image, specifically the shadow tree. What we see are two trees, blackened and one of them seems to be bleeding golden sap. Now back to Mikola at the end of the trailer. He is golden, almost angelic, pure and radiant, he shrives clean the hearts of men. The veil has been lifted, meaning the shadow is no longer obscured from the world, but rather, once again, a part of it. 
Everything once deemed unwanted and shunned is once again embraced and loved. And the wound of the shadow tree that was once gushing golden sap is healed. This wound on the great tree is yet another symbol of America's psychological wound. The earth tree sap was once a part of the age of plenty where it was used to give birth in the lands between. Much like how a mother's womb gives birth to her child. Yet this age of plenty quickly came to an end and that was the time the earth tree was seen more as a symbol than anything else. It was at this time that her blessed dew, her womb, shifted from life giver to life taker, and thus the shattering occurred. Recall that when the ego consciousness is suffering and wounded, the shadow gains power and slowly takes over. This is what we see happening with the collection of the sap. The shadow is using the wound to make itself stronger. In one tiny two second cutscene, we get the true ending of Elden Ring. The end of Merica's journey. Her metaphorical, psychological, and all too real wound is finally healed and the cold, dark shadow has finally been met with a warm, golden embrace. Beautiful, emotional, and an awe-inspiring story. <laughs>